Hi, Will Duvall here, lead pastor of West Hills Church, and on behalf of all of us at West Hills, I just want to thank you for watching this sermon online. If you're watching this, you're likely one of two people. Either you belong at West Hills already, or you're checking us out for the first time. And so let me address both those. First of all, if you're a West Hillian, uh, just a reminder, this is no replacement for being with the gathered church on Sunday morning. And similarly, even if you're new, I hope that this sermon gives you a taste of who we are. But I'll just encourage you too. there's no replacement for uh, being with the gathered church and, and worshiping together, fellowshipping together, sharing the Lord's Supper together, that Sunday morning experience that we can't replicate here online. So for both of you, I want to encourage you to come join us this Sunday at 1030. Uh, we'll hope to see you there. So speaking of uh, what's new this morning in this new year, new service, um, I am so excited to embark with y'all not only uh, in this, this new venture, but also in our new sermon series to kick off uh, 2020. A tough text. I got the idea for this uh, sermon series uh, some time ago, and I'm just so excited that it's finally come to fruition because uh, apparently I'm a, a glutton for punishment. Um, I was this past week mapping out uh, all of the, the 12 sermons uh, that we're going to cover in this series that we have in store. Um, and I did honestly begin to second guess myself a little bit. Like, was this one of those ideas that was great in theory and uh, sounded good on paper? Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're trying to build momentum for a new year and, and new service and all of that, uh, it's a great idea. Who isn't interested in coming to hear? Hear a series like this, uh, whether you're a church and you've got some of these questions too, or you're, you're newer to church and, and you want to hear the pastor try and wrestle through this and explain his way out of some of these texts, either way, this is going to be fun. But in my preliminary study, I started to wonder, you know, what have I gotten myself into here? Some of these texts, I think, are probably going to require, you know, 20, 30 hours of, of study and, and prep work research uh, just for sermon prep. They're so difficult. So if I've retired by the end of March, um, y'all will forgive me and understand. But, but why bother? Uh, why, why, do we even, why do we even bother with the tough text? Uh, and why are these passages so tough in the first place? Let's address both those questions before we dive into our first tough text this morning. First of all, why study these uh, difficult passages of the Bible in the first place? I and mean, after all, aren't these the passages that the church has come to be expected to just kind of gloss over in the Bible? It's kind of, I think that's kind of become the common perception, both amongst Christians and non-Christians alike, is that... And we both recognize that there's, there's some, some stuff in here that if we're really honest, most of us, both in and out of the church at times, kind of wish wasn't there. It's so difficult. And, and so we treat it often as if it weren't. We choose to overlook it. But unfortunately for us, uh, it's not our word. It's God's. Uh, and so try as we may, we, we can't make these tough Text, these passages simply disappear. We have to reckon with them. And I'm going to go beyond that this morning and say reason number one that we're un undertaking this series is that they deserve to be reckoned with. We believe at West Hills, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture, not just the parts that we like, not just the verses we print on our hand towels, on our bathrooms. I guarantee you, we will not be studying your life verse these next 12 weeks. You don't have any of these passages tattooed anywhere on your body or painted over your mantle place, okay? These are the embarrassing passages that we're usually guilty of trying to hide and cover up in the church. Well, not anymore. If it's really God's word, we're going to trust that it's there for a reason, that God included it for us for a reason. And so we're going to put in the time and the work and the prayer and the study required to un uncover that reason and appreciate it and ask God to help us appreciate these texts for what they are, his inspired word. So reason number one for this series is we're doing it for you, Christian, uh, so that you can be taught, reproved, corrected, trained, so that you can be complete. You will be incomplete 
uh, as a person of God until you have every part of God's word down in every part of your being. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, non-Christian, we're doing it for you as well. Uh, we don't want to be a church that just preaches to the choir every week. We want to engage with those outside the church in real life impacting ways. Try and bring them in. And I recognize uh, that, you know, this is partially because it's part of my own story. Personally, part of the reason that I walked away from the church many years ago was because I felt like I wasn't getting real answers to my real questions and doubts and struggles of the faith. These, and the kinds of churches that ignore difficult passages of the Bible are the same kinds of churches that ignore people with difficult questions about the Bible. And we don't want to be one of those churches here. And so if you're here, you're newer to church, we're glad you're here. And uh, I just want to encourage you, this is uh, a, a, a safe place to come, bring your honest doubts, bring your questions. Heck, I'm the pastor and I struggle with some of this too. I struggle to accept and believe and celebrate some of these difficult passages we're going to dig into these next 12 weeks. Um, and so bring your questions. Uh, I've got my own. We'll work through them together. Okay, that's reason number two. And finally, reason number three, Christian we're doing this series to better equip you, not only personally in your own growth in your faith and understanding and appreciation of God's word, but out of that in your ability then to go and reach others with the gospel as well. This is a, a vitally important series, I think, for those who are estranged from the church. And so I'm going to keep encouraging you, please invite, bring uh, them with you. We talked last week about New Year's resolutions worth keeping in 2020. 20, and I challenged us to step up to God's calling of evangelism and discipleship in 2020. One of the easiest ways you can begin to do that is simply invite people with you to church. And so I encourage you, grab a couple of those uh, invite cards that we put at the um, info bar on your way out, drop them in your neighbor, neighbor's mailboxes, uh, take the, the, the online shareable social media one on Facebook and Instagram that Thad posted this past week, blast those out, share it with your friends online, but also recognize that some of the people in your life you can invite a thousand times, and you should, but they might still never come. And as the old saying goes, you might be the only Bible they ever read, and yet they might know just enough of the real Bible to know that perhaps you're conveniently leaving out some of the more difficult parts. And so this series is intended to help equip you better for the work of apologetics. Apologetics is defending the faith, defending the hope of Jesus that is within you, 1 Peter 3.15. So those are the three reasons we're doing this series. Uh, quickly, four reasons that texts are tough. What makes a passage of Scripture difficult? Uh, four reasons in order of increasing difficulty. Number one, we sometimes question a passage's relevancy. What's the point? Well, maybe it's just difficult to understand why of all the things God could have spent valuable pages of Scripture covering, why he bothered including this seemingly trivial passage in there. Number two, there might be questions of consistency. Uh, how does this passage fit with what we know from science, from history, from elsewhere in Scripture? Uh, Jesus himself said in John 10, 35, that the Scriptures cannot be broken. So the primary uh, interpretive principle that we use in the church for exegeting Scripture is called the analogy of faith, or what the Reformers called a sola scriptura, Scripture alone. Not the Pope or anyone else. Opinion uh, that really matters. It's the Bible. The, the Bible itself is going to be the final authoritative interpreter of of itself. And so if the Bible is really God's inerrant word, that means it's without error. It makes no mistakes because it's God's word and God doesn't make mistakes. Then the best way to ensure that we're understanding any individual passage of scripture rightly is to compare it against other uh, passages we find elsewhere. But with some of these passages that we're going to study, that becomes really really tricky and, and we just see there's major valid concerns about consistency. Number three, we might have issues with a passage personally. I've got problems with this passage because it personally challenges me in a way that makes me really uncomfortable. If I'm honest, I want a comfortable faith. And this passage is frankly unsettling. 
Faith is supposed to be, serve some functional purpose in my life. You know, give me you know, hope and meaning, comfort. Uh, and this, this unsettles me. Finally, number four, and I think most troubling for most of us, are the passages that challenge us theologically. If this is really God's word, what does this passage say about God? If this is his autobiography that he's giving us to show us his, his heart, his character, what does this passage say about God? There are some troubling passages. Do I even like the God that is depicted here? Is he the kind of God that I can get behind worshiping? Those are weighty questions that we're going to get to in this series. So those are the four reasons that a text can be tough. This morning, I'm, I'm starting easiest and working my way over 12 weeks to the hardest. So we'll, we'll get a warm up here, but a really a still difficult, still tough text this morning. The grouping of text, we should say, uh, we're going to consider kind of that whole category of text uh, of number one above the seemingly irrelevant. What's the point? The passage is in there that you, you just think, God, why did you spend so much time? So without further ado, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word from the book of First Chronicles chapter 1. <clears throat> we'll begin in verse 1. Okay. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rephath, and Togarmah. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Ketim, and Rodani. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Sabakta. The sons of Ramah, Sheba and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuhim, Pashrusim, Kasluhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtarim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. The sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Meshech. Arpachshad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Amodad, Shelef, Hazar Mafeth, Jerah, Hadaram, Uzal, Dekla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. Shem, Arpachshad, Shelah, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Serug, Nahor, Terah, Abram, that is Abraham, the sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael. These are their genealogies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, to God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to humble ourselves in submission this morning under your inspired, inerrant, perfect word and trust that everything that we find there uh, has a reason why you included it, that it is useful. All scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness that we might be complete. And so, Father, as we spend some time this morning reflecting on some of the passages that if we're honest and confess this morning, maybe we've too quickly glossed over and underappreciated. God, I pray that you would be glorified as your people uh, seek to hear from you uh, in a new way uh, and uh, interpret, apply, put to, to use your word this morning in our lives, that you might get glory and we might be edified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, 
And now before you get upset that I just asked you to stand for half of 1 Chronicles chapter 1, I originally had a couple more chapters in there, and for sake of time, I uh, had, had to cut. Let me just remind you that Nehemiah chapter 8 tells us that at the ded dedication of the city wall of Jerusalem in the 5th century B.C., Ezra assembled the whole city and read the entire book of Moses. He stood for the whole thing, and presumably they did too. Uh, the whole book of Moses, that's the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, in one standing. And I promise you there's a whole lot more begatting uh, in the entire first five books of the Bible. Um, boring list that they had to stand through. Genesis 5 records the first genealogy in Scripture from Adam all the way down to Noah. And then chapter 10 lists the generations from Noah down to the, the architects of the Tower of Babel. And then very next chapter, 11, we hear from them all the way down to Abraham. And that's not even all the list in the book of Genesis. And Genesis probably has the fewest list of any of the books of the Torah. In fact, we studied the longest chapter of the Bible last week, Psalm 119. But Bible trivia question, anybody know the second longest chapter of the Bible? Any guesses? Number seven, 89 verses. 89 verses outlining the offerings God instructed Moses to dedicate upon consecrating the tabernacle. That's the portable temple that uh, the Israelites constructed and carried with them through the wilderness, uh, the seat of God's presence after their exodus from Egypt. Speaking of that exodus from Egypt, you may remember the famous exodus, right? We all remember that, the book named after it, the epic story uh, of God's deliverance of his chosen people through his servant Moses, the burning bush, the ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, all culminating in perhaps the most important chapter of the entire Old Testament, Exodus 20, where God gives them the Ten Commandments. What you may not remember is that the book of Exodus goes on for another 20 chapters after that. And the second half is almost entirely comprised of the kind of seemingly irrelevant, outdated list that we're questioning this morning. These are the section headings. Laws about altars. Laws about slaves. Laws about Sabbath. Laws about festivals that we no longer celebrate. The blueprints for how to build the tabernacle and the blueprints for all the stuff that it contained. The Ark of the Covenant. The table of bread. The golden lampstand. The bronze basin. The bronze altar. The altar of incense. The courtyard. The oil for the lamp. The oil for the anointing. A priest. The priest's garment how to make those details for how to anoint the priest, even a list for how they're going to pay for all this. And then because those lists from Exodus 25 through 30 weren't enough, they basically get repeated word for word in chapters 35 through 40 with the simple addition of the phrase, now Moses and all the people actually did it, actually built the tabernacle with ten curtains made of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet yawn. The length of each curtain was 28 cubits, the breadth was four cubits, etc., etc. I'm not going to read the whole list again, but you get the point for another six chapters. And we only read one half of one chapter of the genealogical list from 1 Chronicles chapter 1. But if you have your Bible with you, flip open and just check. Notice the author goes on for another eight chapters after that. <clears throat> from Abraham to, uh, Adam to Abraham. From Abraham to Jacob, a genealogy of David, the descendants of David, the descendants of Judah, the descendants of Simeon, descendants of Reuben, of Gad, of Manasseh, of Levi, of Issachar, of Benjamin, Naphtali, Ephraim, Asher, of Saul, all culminating in chapter 9, verse 1, where we hear, so all Israel was recorded in genealogies. Not much of an overstatement. But why? That's our question for this morning. Why? Why? If you are God and you've only got 1,974 pages in my Bible to communicate everything that people need in regard to faith and practice for the rest of human history, and I'll go beyond that because Isaiah 48 says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So if you are writing for eternity, why in the world would you spend 
I'm going to be conservative in my estimate here and say 15 to 20 percent of your holy, inspired, God breathed word on genealogies filled with obscure people who no one remembers today, measurements for furniture that has long since decayed and disappeared, and instructions for laws and sacrifices and festivals that no one still observes today. Why do you do that? At the risk of oversimplifying the answer this morning, I'm going to give you a very simple, straightforward answer. God cares. Because God cares. He really cares about the little stuff. Jesus says in Luke 12, 7, that God goes so far as to number the hairs on each of your individual heads. That's how much he cares. Every single hard to pronounce, otherwise utterly forgotten name that we just read from 1 Chronicles 1 is there because it's not just a name to God. It represents a historical person and God has not and will not forget them because people matter to God. That's reason number one. I'm going to give you seven reasons now, seven specific reasons why God cares so much, why he spends so much time and space on things like boring lists in the Bible. Seven specific things that they prove about what God cares about, his heart. Number one, most importantly, is for people. They prove that God has a heart for people, that he cares about people. Every name is a person and people matter to God. That's why we do things like take attendance here at West Hills. That's why we care about numbers, why we track things, and we can get excited about 30 plus percent growth since this time last year. Because behind every number is a person. It's you. It's you. Just quickly, show of hands, how many of y'all were not here this time last year at West Hills? That's amazing. That's so exciting. Not because it makes me feel good about myself when you know we outgrow one service or something like that but because every single one of y'all matters to god and that means you matter to us here at west hills and it's good to have you here with us worshiping fellowship fellowshipping serving growing together because we care about you god cares about you number two god cares about his plan he cares about you individually, personally, but God also cares at a macro level about his broader plan of redemption for all creation we hear in Romans 8. He's got a plan, and genealogies help us connect the dots. Yes, God cared individually for this man, our Pakshad, but he didn't just care for our Pakshad. God cared for him because he knew that through him and through the dozens of other uh, uh, descendants in our Pakshad's lineage, God was knitting together a plan to ultimately restore rescue the entire world from sin through his prophecy of Messiah and Son, Jesus. And indeed, it is because of these genealogies from 1 Chronicles 1 through 9 and Matthew chapter 1 that we know that our Pakshad was the great, 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 six greats, grandfather of Abraham, who was the great, great, great times 11 grandfather of King David, who was the great times 25 grandfather of Jesus. Every name in the list represents a thread that God is interweaving in his great tapestry of grace and promised redemption. It's a beautiful thing. Number, uh, number three, reason number three that God includes things like list is that God cares about the past. Genealogies don't just point us to where history is headed, God's plan for the future, they also point us back and let us know where we came from. This was especially important to the ancient Israelites. Michael Hoodman explains, family history was important to Israel in that it proved one's identity as a Jew, a partaker of the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people chosen by God. If a person was not a Jew, he or she could not truly be a Jewish citizen and participate in all aspects of Jewish life and culture. So family history was also important due to where one came from. Each of the Jewish tribes had received a land inheritance from Israel. There's another list we could have read. All the tribes and their inheritance and where they're supposed to, you know, the boundaries on the map of where they're supposed to live and how much they inherit. 
For a person to inherit land in a particular tribal area required evidence that he or she was descended from that particular tribe. So a family's history could also show an affiliation with people of significance. A Jew descended from someone like Moses or Gideon was considered to possess a significant blessing. So at a macro level, your genealogy uh, is kind of similar to your testimony. Why do we have people share their life stories when they come up and be baptized here at West Hills? Because none of us exist in a vacuum. Right? We, we are certainly more than the set of events and circumstances that have shaped our lives but we're not less than that. Our past matters. Family of origin matters. Your spiritual genealogy, if you're a Christian, matters. Every single one of us who is a born-again believer in Christ could theoretically trace our spiritual lineage back through the person who helped lead you to faith to the person who evangelized and discipled them, your spiritual grandparent, back to your spiritual great-grandparent, and so on and so forth, theoretically all the way back to Jesus' earlier, earliest followers, the disciples. That's, that's amazing. And it's amazing not only because it reminds us of the debt of gratitude that we owe to our spiritual forefathers. You know, we stand on the shoulders of others here. This thing called Christianity did not originate with you and me. Um, but it also ought to motivate our present. You know, the past inspires and motivates our present. Looking back and realizing what God has accomplished for me through others inspires me to prayer that God might see fit to use me in the same way in someone else's story, to be another link in that chain that God is building a people for himself, a kingdom into history future. I want to be a part of that. Number four, uh, reason number four, because lists like genealogies and city names are rooted in past history, that means they also serve the purpose of boosting our confidence in the reliability of Scripture. And that's really important. God cares about plausibility. The plausibility, reliability, trustworthiness of his word. Christianity is pretty rare as far as world religions go in that ours is a historical faith. Uh, the Abrahamic, you know, Islam and, and Judaism, Christianity. We are historical faith. It's not just some pie in the sky, abstract, unprovable principles and philosophies for life. A lot of this book is made up of names of real people, of, of dates and places, of real historical places and, and history events that actually happened. You can fact check it. Our faith is not a blind faith. Sure, we believe without full sight, but we don't believe without any sight. We don't believe without any evidence. And so much of the evidence for the reliability of God's word is right here. You can fact check this thing. It proves itself to be 100% reliable. And if you doubt that, uh, if you want to debate that, I invite you back next week, because next week we're going to focus on category number two that we looked at before, the alleged contradictions in the Bible with science, with history, with itself. We're going to hash all that out next week. But suffice it to say that these, these seemingly meaningless lists are very meaningful insofar as they bolster our confidence in the Bible's credibility. Number five, reason number five that these genealogies and lists of measurements are important is that they show us that God cares about the particularities. You'll notice the, the, the P sort of... Uh, Repetition here, the, the uh, synonyms are going to get more and more bizarre um, from the thesaurus here. But particularities, God cares about the particularities, the details. Most Americans today would uh, still simply uh, self-identify as Christians in a survey, but they would do that because they, they don't really have language for differentiating between Christianity, real Christianity. They don't really uh, believe in the God of the Bible. Uh, their actual brand of belief is better described by sociologist Christian Smith as moralistic, therapeutic deism. It's the, the term he coined for this. In other words, most people, most Americans today, actually believe, not in the God of the Bible, but uh, that the idea of God serves a functional purpose to make us moralistic, try and be a good person, or else. So God uh, is, is useful, the, the idea of God is useful because he pr provides moral accountability, some sort of cosmic policeman. 
God serves a therapeutic purpose. It's comforting to believe uh, in this vaguely benevolent force somewhere out there. Uh, it's comforting be to believe in the idea of life after death, to believe there's a deeper reason for the suffer suffering that I experience in this life. But that's about all that God is, is useful for. Try and be a good person. Maybe it'll work out for you in the end. It's the God of deism. Deism says that God cared enough to create everything that we see. Uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, right? But beyond that, that's about all God cared enough to do. He made the Big Bang Bang. God pulled the trigger, and then he took a vacation for a few million years, and he's generally disinterested with my day-to-day -day life. Friends, that is not the God of the Bible. And these seemingly boring lists that we're studying today prove that. They call God whatever you want. You may have some problems. You may have some issues with the God of the Bible that we will take up and discuss in these coming weeks. But, but call, say whatever you want about Yahweh, but you cannot call him disinterested. He's the kind of God that gives you 89 verses of detail about what kind of sacrifice would be pleasing to him when you dedicate the tabernacle that you built according to the six chapters worth of detail that he gave you about that. Our God cares about the details, the particularities, the hairs on your head. Matthew 10, 29, every sparrow that falls to the ground. God knows every bird that's ever died since the start of the world. That's the kind of God we worship. He really cares. Number six, he even cares about the prosaic. New word for some of you, the boring, the mundane. Listen, let's get real for a minute. Most of y'all live mostly boring lives. I mean, I ask most of y'all what you do for a living, and then I got to go take a nap. Uh, even those of us who do interesting things, like pastor, how much of our days are consumed, my days are consumed with the mundane, with flossing, with shaving, with waiting on the coffee maker, on traffic, on the Wi-Fi, on my dog to finish pooping so I can clean it up. These, this is the real stuff of life. Most of our lives are boring. I would estimate, conservatively again, most of us spend at least 15 to 20% of our lives being utterly boring, and yet we find hope in the genealogies, in the list of measurements, in a God who cares enough about the mundane to include it in his eternal word, because that means he cares about my mundane too. Thad, uh, Pastor Thad got me a, a book for Christmas, Every Moment Holy by Douglas Cain. Subtitle, Liturgies for the Ordinary Events of Daily Life, and he's got prayers for making coffee, you know. I haven't checked it out yet, but I'm excited to in the new year. Get yourself a copy. Get yourself a copy this year. Watch God fill the mundane parts of your day with new meaning and new joy as you worship an almighty God who is big enough to create the entire visible and, and invisible universe and yet personal enough to care about your flossing routine. That's the kind of God we serve. Lastly, number seven. Lest we think too quickly, go to the opposite end of the spectrum now, lest we think too quickly that just because it's in his list, uh, it's in list form, it's necessarily boring. And lest we too quickly just breeze over, skip over these passages of scripture when we come to them, let me remind you that while God cares about the prosaic, he also cares about what is most paramount. The things that matter greatly. After all, it is not in the Bible by accident. God could have included any number of things in Scripture that he didn't. He included these lists for a reason. And so I'll leave you with this this morning. Much of what you and I simply breeze over in Scripture, the seemingly mindless, repetitious list that will derail many of y'all's New Year's resolutions to read through the Bible cover to cover when you get to the second half of Exodus and you get to Numbers and Deuteronomy, much of that stuff is there not because it's 
insignificant, but because it's very significant. It's there for a reason. Paramount importance. The chapters and chapters in Second Chronicles describing exactly how the temple was to be built. The nine chapters to, to close out the book of Ezekiel prophesying the detailed construction of the new temple upon Christ's second coming. The 27 chapters of Leviticus outlining the entire sacrificial system. These are not small matters. They matter to God because the temple matters to God. It's the seed of God's very presence in and amongst his people. That matters. The sacrificial system matters. It was God's appointed means for people to atone for their sins and repair ruptured relationship with God. That matters. Eschatology matters. God going to great lengths to, to, to assure us of the glorious hope awaiting those of us who belong to him, the end times. These things matter to God, and so they ought to matter to us. Friends, God cares. He really cares. He cares about people. He cares about his plan. He cares about the past. He cares about historical plausibility. He cares about the particularities of life. Even the boring ones, he cares about the prosaic, and he cares, definitely cares, about what is most paramount. He really cares. And so when you come to these so-called boring passages of God's Word in your own personal study of Scripture in this new year and in the weeks to come, I just want to encourage you to think just a little more before hastily skipping over them. They're there for a reason. All scripture is God-breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness that you may be complete. May we be more complete people in 2020 as we seek to shine a light on some of these passages that we've all too often ignored in the church. Amen? Let's pray.